Welcome, everyone here in the Del Mar Center, those online on Zoom and later on YouTube. This is the Sea Ranch Forum. My name is Linda McCabe. I'm your, the chair of the Sea Ranch Forum, and we are a historic institution at the Sea Ranch. Started over 50 years ago, and we are not an official committee, so we are not part of the association proper. So we, do, we are independent of the board of directors and of the community manager. So um, safety first. If you need to, these doors that have exit over it are the fire doors. If you need to use the restrooms, they are not in this building. They are across the sidewalk to that white building to the left. Um, may we never need it, but there is an AED over here on the wall. And this is a good time to silence your phones. Unless, of course, you're on the organ transplant waiting list and you think today's your lucky day. So if it goes off, we'll all be pulling for you, okay? And I want to say there is going to be a reception afterwards in the Del Mar house so you can meet and mingle with all the candidates and maybe ask some specific questions of your own. I wanted to state that Picture. I am... I am not biased on this. I have not donated any money to any of these campaigns nor endorsed any candidate. And I have only met one of the candidates briefly last year at Assemblyman Jim Wood's town hall meeting. And schmoozing for five minutes isn't enough to garner my support, Ted, sorry. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hearing their replies to these questions to help me determine who to vote for. And I hope that others in this district will learn enough from this forum to help them make their election choice. So I'm going to give a little thing about the format. Each candidate is going to have introductions for five minutes. Then um, I will be giving questions to each candidate and their con concluding remarks. The goal is to start at 445 for that is two minutes per candidate. And come on up here because my, my friend Catherine is going to help with the timing right up there. So the order of speakers, and the order <laughs> was determined by the order in which they responded to my invitation. So the first one is Rusty Hicks. Second is Mike Greer, Ted Williams, Chris Rogers, Ariel Kelly, then Frankie Myers. And you are all invited to come up and speak here for your opening and closing remarks, but Otherwise, you'll be sitting at the chairs. It'll be faster. Okay? So come on up, Rusty. I'm grateful I get the um, opportunity to, to step to the, uh, to the big podium. Um, and uh, first, I just want to say thank you uh, to the Sea Ranch Forum, and uh, thank you to all of you uh, for the opportunity to come together and have uh, a conversation and be in community uh, with all of you. Uh, my name is Rusty Hicks. Uh, my day gig, if you will, outside of being a candidate for the second assembly district uh, is as chair of the California Democratic Party. Uh, the first chair from a rural part of the state. I've been proud to uh, help pass Proposition 1, ensuring that we enshrine the right to reproductive freedom here in California in our constitution. Uh, helping to make it easier uh, to vote here in, in California. Um, I, was, I was born and raised in, in Texas. Don't hold that against me. I got here as fast uh, and as quickly as I could. I was raised by a single mother who struggled to make ends meet like so many single mothers do. Uh, my father was incarcerated. Uh, I met him for the first time when I was uh, 11 uh, years old as he sat in a, a Texas uh, prison. Uh, I was the first in my family to go to and graduate from college, but I wasn't the last. Uh, in fact, my own mother delayed her own collegiate career uh, by 20 years. Uh, and in some ways, we sort of went to college together. I got the opportunity to, to attend uh, my mom's college graduation just two short years uh, after mine, um, which is obviously a, 
uh, an inspiring, exciting moment uh, for, for our family. Um, I think each in their own way, uh, both of them really taught me the value of hard work and what it means to work for a living. Uh, they taught me the power of an education and the power of a second chance. In many ways, they taught me what it means to serve, the value of service uh, and, and sacrifice. And that's been my career. Um, I served in the labor movement, representing working people, uh, helping them fight for better wages and benefits to provide for themselves and their families. Had the opportunity to lead a campaign to raise the wages of nearly a million workers, to build more affordable housing, to create good jobs, especially for those that have been historically disadvantaged, veterans, women, um, communities of color, the formerly incarcerated. I'm proud of the service uh, that I gave to our nation, both here at home and abroad. I was a member of the United States Navy Reserve uh, and deployed to Afghanistan in 2012 uh, and 13. And today I'm really proud of the service that I do in the classroom. Um, I mentioned that my father was incarcerated. Meeting him at 11, three years later, at the age of 14, I go to that very same institution and attend my father's high school GED graduation and watched him get awarded his, his diploma after dropping out at 15 years old. Some 30 years later, I get the opportunity to serve as an associate professor with, with College of the Redwoods. And I travel each and every Monday to Pelican Bay State Prison and teach incarcerated students American government. Interestingly enough, our class on Monday is about civil rights. So it's an interesting exercise to teach about civil rights to those who simply don't have any for the, at this particular time in their, in their life. I think my record demonstrates that I'm a proven leader that has delivered real results for, for real people. And here on the North Coast uh, and across California, I think it's clear that we have some massive challenges uh, that we're facing, whether it's the climate crisis that we're seeing day in and day out, whether it's the issues of rural health care and the accessibility and affordability of health care, especially in rural communities, uh, just the general affordability, the idea that you can make a dollar go further in a rural part of the state simply doesn't add up. And folks here on the North Coast are really suffering as a result of that. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of uh, the campaign that I've been a part of in these short few, few weeks. I'm proud to have the support of Assembly Member uh, Jim Wood. Uh, proud to have the support of Wes Chesboro and Patty Berg, who formerly served uh, this part of the state, uh, and working people, the California Labor Federation, firefighters, nurses, teachers, uh, vote vets, uh, and Equality California. Um, and so I I'm excited about the next 25 days, not that anyone is counting. I think we all are counting, uh, but certainly look forward to your questions and the opportunity to continue uh, the conversation. Thank you. I'm Mike Greer. I'm the token Republican. I'm here because I think they want me to get your hearts to get excited about politics. It's a difference of opinion. I'm from Crescent City. Uh, I'm on a school board up there right now. I also represent uh, Humboldt, Mendocino, Del Norte, and Lake County on the State School Board Association. Um, yesterday morning, I was representing the California School Board at a legislative session, finding out what was going to happen to the schools and what's taking place uh, as far as the budget is. Um, my wife has informed me that I'm on a long loop right now. I uh, have to be back in Crescent City tomorrow. It's my 52nd wedding anniversary, and my wife has assured me that I'd better be there. <laughs> okay, so I will be before I head out the next day. The reason I'm running is things aren't working. It's not happening. You know, I went ahead and did some research on this community and what's taking place. I said, okay, what do I want to address? What's going on? 
But we were fortunate this morning to meet with some of your local people to go through the clinic, to go to the fire station, okay, to go there and find out what's happening. And it's appalling to me to know that you have a, a clinic up there that doesn't have a, an extra source of energy if the power goes out. You need a redundant energy. It's not happening. Why aren't these things? Why haven't they happened in the past? Why haven't we had some of these things that are happening now? They've been going on for 20 years, and nothing has been happening. And why is that? Because the people that represent cities don't understand what rural life is like. I'm in Crescent City. Prior to being in Crescent City, I was actually on the school board uh, in Paradise for 14 years. I was a school board president at the time of the campfire. So I understand what it, community, small communities are like. And now I'm relocated to Crescent City. We were shut down for two weeks for the fire up there. So we had to make decisions with the school board, what's going on and how to do it. We need to change what's happening. I believe in accountability. I believe in holding people responsible for their actions, whether it's an agency, whether it's an individual. I believe that the small businesses have been so overregulated that they're disappearing. I believe that education, we need to take a look at it because it needs to change. And I can say that because not only was I a teacher, I was a union president for California Teachers Association for special education. And also the service center chair over a five county area of over 2000 teachers. And so I learned about how to communicate. As you can imagine, as a Republican with the California Teachers Association, being a president and a service center chair, it was enjoyable. I, I enjoyed it because I learned how to go ahead and connect with people to get problems solved. I've also been a sports official for 35 years uh, for high school and college sports. So I've been in a lot of GM, talked to a lot of people but we need to change things. And that's was the questions come up. I'll go a little bit further on what needs to be changed in education, what we need to do for small businesses, what we need to do about wildfire protection, what we need to do about the infrastructure in California that's been neglected, has not been taken care of. So I'm very grateful that you're here, that almost every, you know, a lot of your chairs are filled and you've got people on Zoom. We appreciate it and thank you because this is the type of forum that that I enjoy. Thank you. I am Ted Williams. A little bit loud there. But um, it's loud because I feel a lot of uh, fury recognizing what's not working in the state. And being in local government, this is my second term as supervisor. Um, and I got into that because I had about uh, eight years as fire chief and I recognized we're, we're not treating fire as public safety in California. How could that be? You would never do that to law enforcement. Somehow fire is this uh, bake sale uh, charity when those are the people that will save up, show up and save our lives. And then of course at the county level, I figured out just about everything else is broken for rural counties. You can put anyone in those seats at a county or a city and you're going to find that it's not Republican versus Democrat. You have, you have the Republican here echoing what I have to say about California not working for rural residents. And this has been a slow motion train. And, you know, we hear a lot of, um, a lot of uh, platitudes about equity. Equity means you ensure a base level of service everywhere, that everyone has clean drinking water, that everyone has broadband that the, there's healthcare access for all. That's not what we see in California. So as a, local, as a county official, I recognize we don't have a partner at the state that's truly um, looking out to make for, for equity. Five years ago, I would have said, the state is structured for counties to succeed. We may have bad management that needs to be replaced, but by design, it should work. I no longer believe that's the case. It is structured for the outcome we're seeing. We're arguing about the, the crumbs. For, for County of Mendocino, you take over $400 million annual budget, you got a board of supervisors that's arguing about less than a million dollars, sometimes maybe $100,000. Everything is earmarked. 
we know how to spend it to get results. We're not allowed to. The state says, here's what you're going to do with the money. And by their instructions, we have people sleeping on the street in sleeping bags, urinating on the sidewalks. And somehow in California, we've normalized that. When I go to Sacramento, I see it right across the street from the Capitol. So I know our Senate and our Assembly, they're well aware of it. They see it like I see it. And nobody has thought, maybe we should do something about that. Um, Anybody here who's worked in local government or the, with the tribe has that experience. Doesn't matter what political party they're with, they know there is something wrong. And this is a seat that doesn't come up very often. Uh, it's critical that we have somebody in there turning it around for us. It could be me, I'm happy to go to Sacramento, but I'm also at the point in life where I just want good work done. If somebody else can do it, great. I'll enjoy being on the coast while they're in Sacramento. Last night, my kid texts me, my son, uh, still a minor, he's in Berkeley, studying in the library, and there's an active shooter, three shots fired. As a parent, that should not be normal. In California, that's normal. So part of my discussion is the state is not partnering with local government in a meaningful way. But then there's a whole lot of services run by the state that just aren't there. We should not normalize school shootings. And this is in the news again and again and again. We're not seeing results out of Sacramento to turn it around. Um, I appreciate all of the candidates. They all have value. It's hard to get up here and talk and campaign nonstop. I am concerned about my party. My party needs reform. I've been a lifelong Democrat. When my party sends the chair to a new area to run against people who've been in that area serving, bringing in outside money, 1% of that funding being in contributions from individuals and district. Does anybody know what kicked off the Coastal Act? What, what project? Yeah, well, I, I think this election cycle may kick off a statewide voter initiative to limit campaign contributions to registered voters within the district because you want the people who are to be represented speaking and maybe speaking with their money. You don't want large checks coming in from Sacramento, Los Angeles, Texas, places far beyond the district because ultimately the representation will go to those that have contributed rather than the people who are here. We've got one seat for, for most of five counties, Northern Sonoma all the way to the Oregon line. Can we please have representation from somebody who's rooted, who's been working for the people in that area. I appreciate you coming out and uh, look forward to the rest of the event. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Rogers. I'm currently on the Santa Rosa City Council. I was born and raised in this district. And growing up, uh, my mom founded a nonprofit called the Early Learning Institute, where she works with special needs kids and their families. And the expectation for me and my brothers was that we would give back to the community that raised us. And, and I know, folks, uh, we could all do each other's intros because we spend so much time around each other. Uh, but there's one specific incident that really shapes for me who my mom is and the values that she instilled in me as a public servant. We were volunteering and somebody walked up and listened about the services that they delivered at the Early Learning Institute. And then the person said very politely to her, well, why should my tax dollars go towards helping kids who are never going to amount to anything? And without skipping a beat, my mom said, because if it was your kid, you'd want somebody to care. And for me, that's what public service is. It's about showing up for your community and letting them know that you care. I started working with Lynn Wolsey when I was 18, working on public policy and helping to represent Mendocino and Sonoma County. I worked for the legislature for over a decade, finished up as senior staff for Mike McGuire, spending every day up and down the North Coast with Mike, learning the district's issues, meeting the folks that he was representing, and making sure people knew that somebody in Sacramento cared. I ran for my local city council in 2016. I won, and less than a year after I took office, we had the Tubbs fire. 
We lost 3,000 homes. Uh, we lost dozens of lives. Uh, my sister-in-law's aunt is actually one of the folks who perished in the fire. And watching the struggles of my community as they have tried to move barriers to get people home has been what public service has been all about for me. In my time on council, I've had to help lead my community through four wildfires, a pandemic, a drought, and a flood. And there is no time where it's more important for government to work for the people it serves than when you're in crisis. When I was mayor, I got to serve two years as Santa Rosa's youngest mayor. Uh, I invested in people. We brought forward a first time home buyer program for low income individuals because those were the workers that were finding it hard to be rooted in our community. We brought forward two affordable childcare programs so that that way we could stabilize and expand access to affordable childcare for young families. We brought forward a baby bonds program where now every single low income baby born in Santa Rosa has a child education savings account started for them by the city that when they turn 18, they can use on a two year, four year or technical training education. I care about investing in people and I care about my community. That's why I've been involved in public service and that's why I'm running for the state assembly. We need universal health care in California. We need to be the leader on climate change in California. We need to invest in our infrastructure and our roads, hold PG&E accountable, hold the CPUC accountable, because these guys are right. Those are the aspects that are broken right now in California, and I hope we'll get into it. I've been very proud to serve my community for 20 years. Uh, I have worked very hard because it's where I'm from. It's where my wife and I are starting our family. Uh, and I have garnered a lot of support in this campaign, not because I come from a lot of power, not because I come from a lot of wealth, but because I've worked my tail off for the people I represent and I've delivered. Very proud to have the support of Congressman Mike Thompson, former Congresswoman Lynn Wolsey, Senator Mike McGuire, uh, three Mendocino County supervisors and four Sonoma County supervisors, as well as a hundred other current or former local elected officials who have worked with me to get the job done for the people we represent. The Sierra Club, the California Nurses Association, and I'd be honored to have your support as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ariel Kelly. And for the past year as mayor of Healdsburg, I'm proud that we've reduced homelessness by over 60%. We have more homes in the pipeline, including homes for our senior community than at any time in the past 20 years. Uh, I have the endorsement of my entire city council, many folks who we don't agree politically, but they know I'm the kind of person who sees a problem, builds a plan to solve it, brings minds together who can solve that problem, rolls up my sleeves and gets to work. I'm the mom of two amazing kids. They're eight and 10 years old. And a few years ago, I was voted North Bay's 40 under 40. So that gives you a hint that I'm officially over 40. In case you were wondering, today I was knocking on a voter's door and they said, are you old enough to vote? I said, what a kind compliment, thank you. Uh, so in this work, I really find that my greatest strengths are connecting with individuals building relationships with people in our community. And frankly, this campaign, many of you know, Jim Wood decided to retire uh, just at the end of November. So this has been a four month sprint for everyone in this race. And frankly, not enough time to really build the relationships necessary to, to build that trust. And so we're all sprinting at high speed. Uh, in my work, I am the founder of a local nonprofit in Sonoma County called Corazon Healdsburg. Corazon means heart in Spanish. And we work with youth and their parents on ending cycles of poverty. We have helped thousands of families, both with early childhood education, prenatal education, and adults who want to learn English, get computer skills, Im improve their opportunity for higher paying jobs in Sonoma County. After working at Corazon and running for city council in 2020, where I was the highest vote getter out of seven candidates and the highest vote getter of any candidate in the history of Healdsburg, I uh, was recruited to do a nonprofit called Pillar. And in that work during COVID, we granted 
over $7 million to small businesses up and down the West Coast. And we did that to help businesses survive and thrive through COVID and really being able to sit down one-on-one -on -one with small business owners and understand what were the challenges that this, this regulatory environment, how they were being impacted, has really shaped my, my policy-making stance on a lot of the work we do around supporting small businesses and assuring that they have the resources necessary to be successful. I'm an attorney, I have an MBA, I've worked in government, nonprofit, and the private sector. My law practice in the past, um, I'm a recovering attorney now, uh, but before I had kids, I was practicing law and work around land use issues in the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, that's why I was appointed to the Sonoma County Planning Commission in 2017 after the Tubbs fire. We worked on streamlining permits to help people rebuild their homes, and we also worked on the local coastal plan issues like the general plan, major land use planning efforts that really define the future of Sonoma County. And I was proud to have a seat at the table and to work to try to improve and streamline our ability to, to get government functioning at the county level. Uh, for many folks in the room, maybe you've tried to pull a permit before and you know that there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy that exists at the local government level. And frankly, it wasn't, it wasn't until the Kincaid fire in 2019 that greatly impacted our community um, that made me realize unless I decided to step up and run for office, nothing would change. And we saw time and again, we'd have community meetings and conversations around how do we improve our response? How do we have a stronger community? Should we have another disaster? And I realized that nothing was gonna change unless I changed it. I'm proud to have the support of so many folks up and down this district. I have county supervisors, Linda Hopkins, James Gore, David Rabbit from Sonoma County who've endorsed me, Supervisor Maureen Mulheran from Mendocino County, as well as the Assembly Majority Leader, Cecilia Aguiar Curry, as well as the Legislative Women's Caucus, Reproductive Freedom for All, formerly NARAL, has also endorsed me in this campaign. And that's frankly because my very first political activism started at age six when I would go to NARAL rallies for reproductive justice with my mom. And my parents were environmentalists. We, I grew up on the Mackenzie River outside of Eugene, Oregon, uh, where I later went to the University of Oregon and then moved to California to go to law school and met my husband. And I'm definitely a Californian through and through now. So I'd be honored to have your support. Uh, the work that we do representing this district is vitally important. The assembly, while there's 80 members, uh, your representative both will be able to assist you being able to access state resources, but I think most importantly, bringing those state resources home to this community. And we have not seen a lot of action uh, historically, and I think it's time to have a different approach. I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. I was driving down here this morning. I got my little guys in the back with me, and I couldn't help uh, but feel feel the overwhelming beauty of this place that that we live. Uh, and thinking about what we're doing here today, uh, thinking about the purpose uh, of what a representative is supposed to be. And I was reminded uh, a long, long time ago in Nachtigallen for me, uh, it's always set your place. And this has been a short race and we've ran very, very fast. Uh, before we go too much further, I'd like to take some of my time and uh, set us in a good place where we're right here. This is a very special place, some of you know. Um, so I'd like to do a, an opening prayer. If you'd like to stand, that's fine. If you wouldn't, uh, I'm good with that as well. Pray to pray that you watch over us and you guide us as we go about our business today, that you continue to help work to bring us back into balance as individuals, as families, as communities, 
that you continue to work to bring healing to this place that we're at. I think about District 2. And I think about the vastness and, and what we're representing as individuals. And what do I represent as a tribal leader, as a tribal person? And it's more. It's more than just the people who vote for us. More than just the people who are alive today. We believe as tribal people that we're connected to the world around us, that we're a part of this ecosystem. I believe as a representative, we're supposed to represent the entire community, which means our coastline as well, and our forests, and our trees, and our rivers, and our streams, and our people that make our community, that create an ecosystem. I'm not running because of the problems in Sacramento, although I am well aware of them. I'm not running because of the deficiencies I see in the counties or in the cities that I work with. I'm running because of the success that I've had as a tribal leader. I'm running because of what we've done to protect the environment, to build an economy, to bring healthcare to our communities. I'm running because we have a model that is working, working for rural parts of this district, working for our urban areas, developing a restoration economy like none have seen before. I'm running because our success on the Klamath River, I'm running because our success in education in Del Norte County partnering. And I'll tell you one thing right now, moving forward, if you hear someone talking about what it means to be a representative and they're not bringing all the resources to the table like I've seen, they're failing you. If they're not ensuring they're partnering with everyone in their community, they're never gonna represent you in Sacramento. I'm here not because what I'm going to do, but because what I've already done and what I want to do for you. Thank you all so much for coming. If my boys get too loud, let me know, uh, but it is what it is. Top we Sean, thank you. Thank you. The first round of questions are personalized for each candidate. And I'm going to start in reverse um, alphabetical order. And, and Ted, yours isn't really a question. It's more of a public service announcement. I would like you to have this opportunity to speak to the Mendocino County voters about the problems with the ballots that were mailed to them and what they should do to preserve their right to vote in this primary election. Yeah, stay there. Stay yeah. seated. Yeah. So I can I can tell you what I know, um, but I should warn you, um, this is not under the board of supervisors. I know. Really are, I know. Okay. So I just don't I don't want to overstep, um, Katrina. As I understand, uh, first district Republican ballots were mailed to everyone in the county. Um, unless you're a Republican in District 1, you definitely have a ballot. Even if you are in that area, there may be some other problems. They're working on reprinting. We think there's about a one-week delay. There's a frequently asked questions and a press release and a video from our county uh, clerk recorder uh, explaining what went wrong. It appears that it was not county staff that made the mistake. County staff actually proofed and gave the thumbs up, but the printing firm used the wrong documents. This stings for Mendocino County because we've, we've had wrong tax bills, a lot of other problems lately. Here's one more. It doesn't appear that the county has culpability. It looks like uh, it was the vendor. This is one of 12 vendors approved by the California Secretary of State for this purpose. 
And I know, uh, I believe they've opened an investigation. They're looking at how this could happen, how to make sure it doesn't happen again. It, it's just, that, they're, you're gonna be getting new ballots in the mail. You're gonna be getting new ballots in the mail. Try to, try to fill out the correct ballot and send it back. Even if you've already voted on the Republican ballot, the elections office will match your responses to make sure the right ballot is counted. There have been a whole lot of edge case questions. What happens if somebody votes on the Republican ballot and they leave town and that's the last we hear? Um, I think the elections office will try to respect the votes that are applicable um, based on where they live. Um, it's a really unfortunate circumstance. I would recommend reading the frequently asked questions from the county clerk. And if you have, if you're able to go online, you can watch a, a video press release she gave yesterday. Okay, thank you. Chris, you're next. You have an impressive list of endorsements from elected officials, mostly from Sonoma County and the 101 corridor. I have no doubt you would capably represent the needs of those inland com communities. And you work for Senator Mike McGuire, so it is likely you have experience throughout the Bass District. Tell us what you see as qualitative differences in the needs between those who live in the densely populated 101 corridor and those who live in the sparsely populated rugged coastline. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. And I do have uh, relationships and have worked in coastal communities, not just when I worked for, for McGuire, but also when I worked for Lynn Woolsey. Uh, I went to school on the coast as well. Uh, in a word, it's access. Uh, the difference in living on the 101 corridor and on the coast is oftentimes access. And when we talk about things like access to health care, when we talk about Fort Bragg's hospital potentially closing and then the nearest access point for care to be almost two hours away, that's the main difference. And making sure that we have systems in place that are more equitable is one of the focuses of mine. I mentioned in my outset that I'm a big champion for universal health care, single payer health care. Uh, that's why I have support from folks like the nurses. Uh, and uh, I'll mention my wife is a nurse, uh, which didn't hurt either. Uh, those are decisions that are made based on how much money those private providers can make from a community. And in rural parts of the area, particularly on the coast, where it's more expensive for them to put in services, but they get less of a rate of return, that's where you need systems in place like universal health care that is more equity focused and can locate services where they're needed, not just where somebody's going to make money. Uh, we understand that the coastline is iconic in California. It, our natural environment is why most of us appreciate living here. And yes, it's different, uh, but that doesn't mean that the needs shouldn't be met and that the access to healthcare, the access to transportation, the access to economic development should be inequitable as well. Okay. Frankie, in your candidate statement, you mentioned leading the effort to bring fiber optic cable from Crescent City to Oric. The Sea Ranch tried for years to get vendors to install that communication infrastructure here, but none were willing to make that investment. So we wound up financing that ourselves, and we created Sea Ranch Connect that has fiber optic to each house or lot. And my family has a better connectivity here at Sea Ranch than when we lived in an apartment on Fountain Grove in Santa Rosa. I would like to know how you financed your project. Was it with grants, loans, mixture of both, and how you as an assembly member would help to get fiber optic cable infrastructure to underserved areas of this district, such as Point Arena, Walala, Stewart's Point, the Kashaya, and Timber Cove? I want to first be clear. It wasn't, uh, as was stated in my candidate statement, uh, broadband from Oric to Crescent City was actually uh, a part of a larger project, bringing broadband from I-5 to 101 and then connecting back up to uh, Crescent City while continuing to build redundancy uh, down 96 as well. Uh, it's installing three new lines uh, around $200 million uh, project, of which 
120 million is currently funded. Uh, the other 80 million is in the process through uh, going through uh, CEQA and, and NEPA because it crosses the Redwood National State State Park. It's one I was referring to earlier in my opening comments. As a tribal leader, I don't have uh, the privilege to not pull on every resource available. As a tribal leader, I have to work uh, as a sovereign government between multiple agencies, between the federal government and the state, as well as the counties. The project that we laid out uh, was through a series of grants uh, through the state of California, as well as the federal government, uh, using uh, a very small amount of initial investment uh, to get the company up and running. Uh, as a tribe, we're afforded the creation of corporations, so we created the corporation to go after funding that allows for both personal investment as well as granting opportunities. It's one of those successes that I feel like uh, would love to see throughout the district. Thank you. Ariel, you claim to have helped decrease homelessness in Healdsburg by 60%. How did you accomplish this feat and how could you help to see this success be spread throughout the district? So as we know, homelessness is a very multifaceted challenge. Um, housing plays a role with certainty in ensuring that we're building enough homes uh, at the affordability levels necessary to help folks transition off the street. Um, so we were able to leverage state funds and go after a grant through the Home Key Project, a $7 million state grant, um, to purchase a motel in Healdsburg and turn it into Northern Sonoma County's first ever homeless shelter. Uh, through that shelter, we were able to bring people off the street and provide wraparound resources from job skills training, drug rehabilitation, healthcare services, pet vaccines and visits from veterinarians, but really a true wraparound model. We also took some of our city's uh, dollars that had been allocated to the police to take a li licensed clinical social worker to embed them in our police department and have a full-time staff member to transition away from showing up to a mental health issue with cops with guns and instead of approaching it with someone who has the appropriate training to meet the crisis before them. Uh, so in that work, we've been able to help folks get off the street, get out of their cars and into a shelter, uh, inject a lot of wraparound services with county funding um, to assist those folks and then help them graduate into permanent supportive housing and beyond. We've also been able to use it as an opportunity for folks who don't want to seek shelter, who aren't interested in those resources, and asking them that they either need to be a part of the solution and help get off the street, or that they cannot um, continue to live in a way that is not productive for themselves or others in our community. And so I think with sometimes a tough love approach as a mom, sometimes you know that that's the right thing to do, even if it's uh, not the easiest, and approaching homelessness like the crisis it is. We had a lot of folks in our community who said, if you try to build a shelter here, it is political suicide and you'll never get elected again. Not only did we do it, but we brought the community together in solving it and building consensus, had unanimous votes of our council, and that's the type of work I'd like to do in Sacramento. Thank you. Rusty, as chair of the California Democratic Party, you will have many connections throughout the state and are likely to get legislation passed with more ease than other freshman legislators. However, my concern is that you moved to Arcata only three years ago, and before that you lived in Los Angeles. News reports say that over half of your campaign donations come from outside our district. Described by the voters in the second assembly district should have confidence that you will understand and represent the needs of this vast and rural district when you are a recent transplant from the big city. Well, I certainly appreciate the question. I think um, uh, Councilmember Kelly and her supporters have sought to ensure that everyone understands that uh, I lived in LA for a period of time and recently moved uh, to North, the North Coast. I wasn't fortunate enough to be um, born and raised here, but I feel blessed to be able to have landed here. Um, certainly my work has been on a statewide basis um, and therefore I have relationships all across the state, which I think speak to the campaign that I've built. I'm proud that 
Uh, my support has come from um, individuals and working people uh, and the unions that represent them. Um, I have never been uh, a leader that sought to uh, deliver a particular project by themselves. I think there's a recognition that we all have a role to play in ensuring that we do the best for our communities. Certainly, I have an understanding of how you get something done in the Capitol. I have an understanding of the power of organizing and engagement and movement on the outside. Uh, and therefore, if you want to do anything big, if you want to do anything substantial, it requires partnership, it requires collaboration, which sometimes can be slow and tedious and painful, but that's how you, in fact, um, everyone brings their own to the fight. Um, what I bring to the fight is something different than um, a local elected official might bring to the fight. Um, I think I have a very clear recognition uh, that collaborating and working with uh, those that are on the ground and the most affected and organizing and helping to support them to ensure that their voices are heard in the Capitol uh, is what I bring, uh, I bring to the table and certainly proud of the campaign that I've built to this point. Thank you. Mike Greer, I've got a two-part question for you. First, you are the sole Republican in this race, and the Republican Party has evolved dramatically over my lifetime. How would you classify yourself to give us a better understanding of what kind of Republican are, you are? Do you identify more as an Eisenhower Republican, Goldwater Republican, Reagan Republican, Bush Republican, or a Trump Republican? I like this question. I like this format, too. I declare basically as myself, okay, I am a Republican. It's interesting that my grandmother used to clean house for uh, General Eisenhower. So yeah. I, she taught me to be a Republican. But when I look at issues, I look to see what you have to do that is the right thing. On the school board, I've been I, I have a question about the school board, so hold on. There have been recent efforts in our nation to restrict or remove books from school libraries. And as a school board member, tell us if there were any attempts in your district to restrict and or remove books from your school libraries. And do you support or oppose those movements? First of all, I do not believe in banning books. I am not aware of any book that was banned up in Dale North. Good. Okay. I lost over 1,500 volumes of books. Now, do I think that we need to take a look what those books are for? Absolutely. They should be age appropriate. Okay. Age appropriate books. I don't want to ban any book. If a parent wants their child to read a book, they should be able to read that book. If a child wants to do it, it's easy. There are other ways to do it. You don't need to ban books. So no restricting of books in the libraries due to... No. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Now, I am going to... This is a baseline question. I'm going to start with Chris and go around. So this first question is just a short phrase. Who do you support in making reproductive health procedure decisions? The woman in consultation with her medical providers or judges and politicians? There, there's only one answer, and, and that's women in making it in consult, consultation with their health providers. Thank you. Next, um, Frankie? Yeah. Good. Ariel? Women and partners in consultation with their health providers, I believe that w women's reproductive rights is an issue that everyone, including men and non-binary people, should care about, not just a women's issue. Okay. Thank you. Rusty? Uh, women and they're in consultation with their doctor. Thank you. Mike? Hey, I certainly believe they need to be in consultation. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I adhere to those principles because I am a faithful member of the church, and that basically is what you're really getting at is I do not approve of abortion for convenience or social you know, reasons. Okay. 
So I'm going to follow up question for you. Would you support laws to incarcerate women who seek to have abortions or obtain an abortion or merely the person performing the abortion? I say right now in California, we don't have that issue. Yeah, but what, per, my personal opinion. I mean, if you want to be a legislator. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing we can do. We know that abortion is legal. Okay, in, in California. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was, you know, in the Constitution. Am I going to say, okay, yes, if somebody wants it, that we're going to lock them up? No. Okay. I do not believe that we're going to lock up people. Do, to do, do that. you be, would you support a nationwide ban on abortions? No, because even the church says there are certain instances where abortion could be necessary in conjunction with the physician and with the partners that are involved. Okay. In it. Okay. Um, Ted. Well, I don't know. Um, if somebody has testicular cancer, should it be judges to, who decide whether we're going to treat the patient? It's absurd. It's the woman. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So then I'll start the next question with Frankie. This is kind of a follow-up. Women are traveling to California from states such as Texas, where they are prevented by law from obtaining safe legal abortions, even when their pregnancies are not viable and their lives are at great risk if they do not end their pregnancy. There are now attempts in several of these states to make it a crime to cross state lines to obtain the abortion. What are your thoughts on those attempts to criminalize the freedom to travel and how should the state of California respond to those states? As a tribal leader, these are not metaphorical questions to me. Uh, the right to reproductive health, uh, the right to travel freely, the right to vote uh, in my family have all been legislated, uh, every single one of them. Uh, there were laws against my right to pray. There were laws against uh, our right to vote. And there was a federal program uh, to sterilize our Native women. Uh, these issues are extremely important to me uh, because I know how long and how far the impacts can stretch. And as Mayor Kelly said, these aren't just women issues. Uh, as a grandson of a woman who was a part of the federal sterilization project uh, program. It impacts the entire family, it impacts our entire community. It's very scary to see us heading down uh, the road that we've already come from. And I will tell you, having lived it in my community, it is nothing we want for this district, for this state, or for this country. And I wanna make sure that we have a voice in Sacramento that's clear and can work with the rest of the legislature uh, to help provide that leadership to the rest of the nation, uh, as I believe Governor Newsom has done uh, up to this point. Thank you. Thanks. Ariel. Same question. Um, no, I don't believe we should criminalize anyone for seeking uh, their option to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, I think we have serious problems with the system as it currently stands. There's physicians and medical practitioners in California who are nervous about treating patients who are traveling here um, to seek abortion care because their name will appear on their electronic medical records of that patient when they return home to Tennessee or Texas or elsewhere. And they are concerned about the laws in those other states which could potentially put their license at risk if they were to travel to that state. Um, there's a, a lot of complexities to this issue, even here in California. Um, we have a Catholic and a Christian healthcare system that is taking over over the majority of hospitals in our region and therefore limiting access to reproductive health care right here on the North Coast. We have clinics who are struggling to provide access to, to reproductive health care because of the federal funds that they cannot use towards abortion care. And so therefore they need to use state funds or other sources of funds to keep the lights on and provide those necessary treatments. We have a state system that takes three to five years to review Medi-Cal reimbursement rates and general reimbursement rates. So you have clinics in our community saying, we cannot afford to continue to operate like this. And instead of the legislature 
holding our California Department of Health accountable and saying, you need to move forward and actually process these requests. Um, we have folks in the legislature saying, let's raise the rates, let's raise uh, wages for workers in healthcare, great idea, but not providing the money to allow those clinics to pay their providers. So the revenue doesn't meet the need of these, these clinics, and they're looking towards a really uncertain financial future. So these are real issues right here in California, and we need to all be very acutely aware of the nuances of these challenges and make sure we have someone who's thinking about this issue uh, every single day. Thanks. First, taking a yes, we are all running for the state assembly. We're all running for a state legislative position. But I think we all have to take a step back and recognize that we are where we are today because of what has happened at the federal level. We need a new US Supreme Court. That's not going to happen overnight. And therefore, our election and engagement as California in our national conversation is particularly important, uh, whether it's um, in November or, or beyond. I think California has a unique role uh, just because of our size, the number of electoral votes we have here, the number of members of Congress that are here. We have an outsized responsibility uh, on that front. I think the second is when you see attacks happening all over the country, California has a responsibility to continue to be a beacon for um, hope and reproductive freedom um, um, around the country. Um, and so there's a whole host of ways in which California has already done that. Um, certainly as a legislator, I would be proud to partner with uh, advocates and leaders um, to, to ensure that California does even more, whether it's from a financial standpoint, uh, whether it's addressing our criminal codes, whether it's addressing the relationship that we have with uh, other states with regards to enforcement and the like. Um, at the end of the day, California has continued to be um, a, a beacon of reproductive freedom uh, for the rest of the country. Mike, do you want me to go? Oh, yes. Yeah. What would you do um, for those states that want to criminalize women coming here? Number one, I don't believe in criminalizing. OK, I don't believe in abortion. Uh, but I don't believe that people be need thrown in jail. I don't believe that you be, should just be able to have an abortion because it's convenient for you. For personal or, you know, social convenience. I don't believe in that. 37% uh, of those abortions taking place are of people of color. Okay, so it seems like it's really interesting that the fact that people of color you know, have all these abortions, 37%, and that the, everybody talks about the deaths of young children. There are more abortions than any deaths that we, any other way to do it. I do believe in the sanctity of life. But I believe that there are exceptions to that. Okay. Ted? I have a 22-year-old daughter, and she has a list of states she won't travel through, even on a connecting flight over this issue. And I've mentioned at past events, this is the, really the question she's paying attention to more than everything else, and it's the one that will be remembered. And uh, so I, I agree with what Arielle said. She wins this round. But there's also an element of um, the rest of the nation looking at California. We have rather progressive ideas, and a lot of us believe in those ideas, but we have to show results. And when you have people in other states looking at us and they see we have water shortage, housing shortage, um, homeless on the street, uh, lack of health care access, you, when they see the failures, they think California's ideas are not what we want. And so there's more at stake here federally by the example that we set, and that's why the assembly district seat is so critical because we need the, the way you keep Trump out of office. And I don't think January 6th was a beautiful day at all. If you haven't watched those riots, you should go back and watch. Now is the time to go back and watch it. The way you stop that from happening is you make California work for Californians so that the rest of the country can see we want America to work for Americans. You don't have that today. As a lifelong Democrat, I recognize it's a coin toss who we get in the presidential election. And it's not because Trump is the answer. It's because my party has been tone deaf. They don't, my party doesn't hear the people saying, these policies are not generating the results that we deserve. 
I think we solved it here in California. I think we've solved it in the assembly district and um, we set the example for the nation. Okay. Um, Chris. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. California needs to protect this right uh, with everything that we can. Uh, I mentioned before that my wife is a nurse, uh, exactly to the point that was made. There was legislation that was passed last year in Sacramento to make sure that we protected medical records for gender affirming care and for uh, health reproductive choice, particularly for the individuals who are either traveling here or traveling abroad, but also for the health providers. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, my wife was one of the many nurses who jumped on a plane and went to New York and filled in in their hospitals. And when you look at states that are potentially going to penalize uh, health workers for having participated in reproductive choice, you break down your mutual aid system. You suddenly have folks who are not going to go to specific states to be able to fill in. She actually did medicine for two years in Arkansas, and I don't think she would go back. Uh, we need to protect our healthcare workers. We need to protect folks who are accessing care. We need to be that uh, sanctuary in the storm for folks who are coming here and need to feel like somebody cares that they're going to get access to the health care that they need. Okay, thanks. This next question, I'm going to start with Ariel. And it, this question was by Kevin Evans, our, the president of the Walala Community Center which was established in 1954 and was destroyed by arson last year on February 13th. So we're coming up on the one year anniversary of its destruction. It served many purposes in our greater community and to me, the most important purpose that it cannot fulfill today is to serve as an emergency shelter. However, the U.S. Census Bureau classified Wallala as a census block area. And as a result of this classification, Wallala is ineligible for state and federal grants to rebuild the center. What steps would you take to address the reclassification of Wallala as a census tract prior to 2030 and what assistance would your office provide to secure state and federal grants addressing resiliency, renewable energy, warming centers, and emergency evacuation facility to assist in the rebuilding of our community center? This is a great question and, and one that doesn't just impact the Kuala Community Center, but one that impacts the evacuation sites all across this region. Um, in 2017, I worked in partnership uh, with a number of folks in the community leading an evacuation effort and welcoming our neighbors who had had to flee for the Tubbs fire. And then in 2019, during the Kincaid fire, we helped evacuate over 10,000 people from Northern Sonoma County um, to Petaluma and beyond. And the shelters that we were helping people access were inadequate. We know that we use our fairgrounds and other major meeting points and community centers up and down the coast as points of evacuation. But we're not investing in those spaces to make them resilient during an emergency. And that is critically important that we have these sites. This happened with Cloverdale, which was an evacuation site. They didn't have power, they didn't have food or fuel. And then we closed the freeway during a fire. So people were trapped there with no resources, not even a blanket. And we really must understand this, not on a, a one size fits all approach for the state or one size fits all for the country if you're looking at the federal census, but each community needs to identify and have voice in where do we wanna invest those resources in our communities? Where would people feel safe? to evacuate to, uh, and what kinds of infrastructure is necessary, such as generators or uh, additional redundancies in systems so that when there is a major disaster, when we know there will be another one, unfortunately, um, that these sites have the resources necessary to help us weather that storm. And right now we're not doing that up and down this region. So we need someone who's gonna be tenacious, 
who won't take no for an answer, who knows how to look for those sources of funds. If one door closes in your face, you go find another one. And that's something that I've done for decades in my work and something that I would do to deliver for this community. Rusty, how can you help us? Well, I think there's uh, different ways to get money back, whether it's on a project basis or a programmatic basis. Um, you can do it through the budget process, the budget trailer process. You can try to go to the ballot. I think there's a number of different ways to do that. Obviously, addressing the census track challenge uh, is not something you're going to be able to just change uh, overnight. And therefore, I think you've got to be more creative about how you do that. But this isn't just one particular issue in one particular community, as was already said. It's an issue across this district, but in really, in many ways, it's a, an issue across the state um, because, um, you know, climate related issues and challenges that we are seeing uh, at every single turn is something that in, requires California to build more climate resilient communities into the future. I believe a climate bond. Uh, on the 2024 ballot, or if you have to push it out on the 26 or maybe the 28 ballot, are the kinds of resources, the level of resources that you need in order to address these, these kinds of challenges to ensure that you have uh, essentially resilient micro communities throughout the state to address these kinds of, these kinds of challenges. Um, certainly, primarily because um, bonding authority is incredibly helpful, primarily because you don't have to do it on a budget cycle basis. And it's not a one project um, pot of money that you're providing to one particular community. So certainly, I've been a part of fighting for dollars out of the state budget and fighting for dollars uh, at the ballot. And that's certainly what I would do uh, if elected to the state assembly. Mike, how could you help us? This uh, particular issue is I'm very familiar with having been burned out of paradise. I was a school board president at that time. That morning, because we had school and we were just talking about not having school that day of the fire, we decided to have it. We saved between three to 400 kids' lives because we had school. We saved our buses. We were the evacuation the school district was because we had to take our kids, put them on the buses. As the parents came up to drop their kids off, we told them, go down the hill to Chico. We're meeting at the fairgrounds. So we told them what's going on. Well, a lot of kids are already at school. My daughter had to drive her special education high school students through the flames in her car. It's not an unusual story there. We were up until midnight that night, making sure that every student on the day of that fire got back with their parent. As a school board president, I stayed there and helped rebuild that district. Do I know how to go about doing it? Yes. Have I worked with FEMA? Yes. Have I worked with the state officials? Yes. Federal officials? Yes. There are ways to go about doing it. Are they cumbersome? Yes. But it can be done the red tape has to disappear, and the state keeps putting red tape in the way. They haven't helped until you really get down to the very end and have to really push and push. It's difficult to get the help, especially in the rural community. Same thing in Crescent City. Down for two weeks without power because of the fire up there. We had to go out and get generators. Our school district, was the hub. That was the center they went to because we had the power. We had the food. We continue to do it. Ted? The initiation of the process to get Walala recognized uh, is actually on the Mendocino Board of Supervisors agenda for the 27th. I recommend you call in if you support it. And uh, not really fair to the other candidates here. They didn't have that ability. <laughs> but they could call in at 9 a.m. under a uh, consent calendar and advocate for it. And I'm sure my colleagues would be a little puzzled. Who are all these people joining our meeting? <laughs> um, don't campaign. But the, the, the bigger issue is there are a lot of grants available from the state. And what you find as a rural county or a rural city is um, usually you're not eligible. You spend a lot of staff time, which has a cost, 
going through the process. And at the very end, you learn you don't have growth. Roads is a great example. You can't show that you have growth. And so you're not going to get the, the funds. It'll go somewhere else. Well, we can't have a state structure that's designed around growth always being the correct answer. There are communities that are not growing. They deserve roads. They deserve shelters. They deserve clean water. That's not the system we have. I've gotten pushback for, from various uh, state officials over the years. Ted, you, we're, we're showing up. We want to do a photo op. Find us a problem we can solve. Right? They want to pull out a little bit of direct funding and solve it and get a headline. And what you're talking about is structural problems. But that's the truth. California has severe structural problems that are penalizing people who live in rural communities. Those people pay tax. They matter as well. It may be that it costs a little more to do water in one place, more to do broadband. That is the nature of equity. Stop putting equity on the banner if you don't mean it. And you know we need to get louder as rural counties. I expect our assembly member to be as loud as our state senator. Senator McGuire gets this. He shows up, and there's continuity in this conversation. He understands we've been getting a pretty bad deal on the North Coast. Chris? Yeah, for, uh, first of all, I don't trust the federal government to solve any problem right now, to be honest, uh, especially one where the easy answer for them is to say, well, we'll fix this in the next census. That means 2030, and that means missing the window to be able to access some of the funds. Uh, and what the state really needs to make sure that they're doing is having representation who understands the nuances of individual communities. That when a bill comes forward, uh, that you have a champion or an advocate who can go to the author of the bill or can author the bill to make sure that the criteria that are being created works for the local community. But then that's not it. One of the substantial roles of a legislator is being able to navigate the bureaucracy and work with uh, folks in each of the departments because well-intentioned laws, especially ones that have funding attached to them, then go to the bureaucrats to be able to have, and I, I say this lovingly, I have a master's in public administration, I love bureaucrats, but implementation is really where a lot is lost in the translation. So having somebody who has the relationship with the local community to understand the need, that can craft the legislation appropriately, and then hold the folks who are actually administering the funds accountable for what the intent was, is a multi-step process that requires legislators who work hard, pay attention, and have a really close relationship with their communities. Frankie? We've built three in the last four years. Uh, shelters, community centers, emergency operation uh, facilities um, with no uh, tax base whatsoever. Uh, and we did it uh, by understanding the relationships in the community, relating to the understanding, understanding the relationship between the state, the federal government, uh, and also be willing to bring partners on and look for partnerships outside of uh, what we're normally accustomed to. Uh, I think it's a matter of ensuring uh, that we look to where our resources are, uh, whether it's state funding or federal funding, uh, partnering with our philanthropic community, uh, which is phenomenal and, and only growing. Uh, it's one of those huge successes uh, that we've had in our community, uh, the type of leadership that's developed as a sovereign government, I think is special. Uh, because you understand what nation-to-nation -nation conversations look like. You understand what it means to build communities from the ground up. Uh, you understand what it means to truly have to work uh, with every partner that you can to provide the needed services to our community. Uh, absolutely, we need a strong voice in Sacramento that speaks for our community, but one that knows how to do it uh, and has done it. We need someone that actually understands uh, how you bring people together and implement a complete project to fruition, uh, similar to what I've done uh, working for the Yurok tribe, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Okay. So, Rusty, you're the first one to answer this question. This is about the consequences of good intentions by the state mandating seismic retrofitting of hospitals. Now, this came about after the Northridge earthquake in 1994, when some hospitals suffered great damage. 
the state of California wanted to prevent similar harm to its people in the future, so it mandated hospitals to retrofit their hospitals to comply with newer seismic standards than when they were originally built, all on behalf of public safety. However, rather than assist hospitals in raising funds to perform this needed and expensive expenditure, it kept postponing the deadline for compliance, similar to postponing an execution date of a condemned prisoner in the hopes that they will die of natural causes so that what will be listed on the death certificate is that and not due to the acts of the state of California. Now, the deadline is for compliance is 2030 and we might lose our hospital in Fort Bragg. Public health and safety should be the guiding light on this issue. Small hospitals have a difficult enough time with their regular operating budgets and may not be able to fundraise enough money from their local communities to afford a multi-million dollar capital cam improvement campaign. How would you fight to make sure communities don't lose access to health care because of this unfunded mandate by the state of California 30 years ago? I think first and foremost, we have to take a strong stand to ensure that we are going to find a way to... In, into the microphone a little more. Is that better? Yes. That we are going to find a way to keep the hospital open in Fort Bragg. I know Supervisor Williams has been calling upon all of us to speak strongly uh, in favor of doing what is necessary to keep that hospital open, and I think that he's absolutely right. Uh, we have a responsibility to do that, especially given the care that it provides to such a large community that would not have access um, um, if it was not there. If you don't have health care, you don't really have a community um, in, in many, many ways. It's certainly one that doesn't look the same way. I certainly know that there's uh, been a lot of conversations between Assemblymember Wood's office and uh, local leaders to try to address this issue. Uh, to this point, has not been necessarily successful. In fact, there's a bill that was actually held and turned into a two-year bill, bill in the legislature now to try to address this particular issue. I do think the state has a responsibility to step forward and address, um, to keep standards, to ensure that we keep people and communities safe, uh, but also ensure that we're finding uh, and helping with a path to fund the changes that are truly, truly required. And it is different uh, if you are a for-profit system or you are in a uh, urban area where the, the finances are different, significantly different. Um, and so as, uh, you know, as an assembly member, as a member of the state legislature, Certainly, I would uh, pick up the banner of uh, our current assembly member uh, to ensure that we do everything we can, not just to address the issue uh, of the hospital in Fort Bragg, but issues for uh, rural health care around the state. Okay. Mike? I think it's interesting that this is an issue that's been going on for some time, but yet it hasn't been taken care of. Jim Wood did a lot of good health things. Hospitals was not one of them. Living on the coast is kind of like living in the Hunger Games. It's that simple. We're getting mandates, mandates, and mandates from the state telling us what we have to do. How many places do we have to retrofit for earthquakes when we don't live in an earthquake area? Because it's mandates. The way to take care of it in order to do it is to go ahead and have that voice and to change it. Some things you have to change. Some of these mandates are there, the good intentions, but they don't see what the fallout is, and the hospitals is one of that, especially in Fort Bragg. Now, take a look at it. Do we have to do it all? In Paradise, we had a, uh, right after the fire, our hospital was gone. It didn't burn down, but we couldn't get it reopened. We couldn't put in an emergency center. We tried. We had federal officials there. We had state officials there, but they wouldn't let us put in an emergency center because of some of these mandates, just like your clinic up here. They'd like to do more testing, lab testing, but they can't do it because of mandates. 
we need to have find some way that these mandates apply to local situations and the state does not allow for that and that's something i would do is take away some of these mandates and give more local control Ed? yeah this one's really part this one's really personal for me i've been a firefighter for about 17 years and so i met seeing packaging a lot of people who go to that hospital at a time when we're asking for more access to health care state of california shows up and says if you, your community can't fundraise $20 million, you can close your hospital in 2030. What do you think that will do? It's going to, economically, it'll devastate the North Coast. You got 320 of the best paying jobs. That ripple will be felt throughout the county. Um, but it also literally means death. You're going to have people that can't make it to Ukiah or Santa Rosa. You're going to have other people who don't get an ambulance because the only ambulance on the coast at night is transporting somebody all the way to Ukiah. And with all due respect, Rusty, I think you've taken money from a group that fought Assembly Member Wood multiple times when he tried to extend this deadline, when he tried to find a workaround. I would like that money to be sent back because to me that represents special interest closing our hospital. And it's when you're when the when you look at a spreadsheet and you see the numbers, it doesn't make sense to have a hospital there, right? This is a rounding error for the state. But for those individuals where that is the place they're going to go for definitive care, it's the diff difference between life and death. And for all the others, it's the difference between suffering or suffering less. It's, it's critical. And it really points to the disconnect we see from the establishment to the people who are up close, boots on the ground, seeing the real people. Real people do not want that hospital closed. The answer for all of us should be, we will not let that hospital close. We will not let any rural hospital close in California. There's a lot of options. The state could fund it. The state could extend the deadline. The state could decide categorically a single structure, single story wood structure that meets wind rating is sufficient. It shouldn't be grouped with six story concrete buildings in urban areas. Some healthcare is better than none. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do want to uh, give a nod to the supervisor. Uh, this has been an issue that he's been championing up and down the North Coast. We did a forum in Fort Bragg, I think a week and a half ago, and he invited me to actually come tour the hospital with him to make sure that I understood just how important it was to the community. And so, so thank you for that opportunity. Uh, it was a good tour. Uh, and I agree. Uh, we all need to be a champion for keeping not just that hospital open, but hospitals in all rural areas. Uh, but as I said at the, outside, at the outset, that is treating the symptom, not the illness. The illness is a for-profit healthcare system that delivers care based on how much money they can get out of you, and not a healthcare system that is designed to provide equitable access across the state where we need it. That means a universal health care system. That means a single payer system that delivers care based on necessity and equitably, not based on dollars that they can squeeze from their customers. Uh, that's the only way that we're going to fix this problem, absent Band-Aids. So yes, we'll fight to keep Fort Bragg's hospital open, but we'll also fight to fix the system that allows it to close with nothing else as a safety net for the community. Two things. One, where was my invitation? Uh, which is fine. Fine. I'll, oh, I'll I'm take sorry. It. You you are invited. You will be the first speaker in the queue. Hey, all right. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, and two, absolutely. Uh, we're going to fight to keep that hospital open. And we're going to fight to ensure uh, no rural hospitals are closed. I think it absolutely is a phenomenal question for this race. Uh, because we do need someone in Sacramento who understands the entire community. Uh, too many times we have good ideas uh, that move forward uh, that are simply that, just good ideas. And not every good idea should move forward, especially uh, when you don't consider all of the consequences because you don't understand your entire community. Uh, we have new clinics opening up all over the place in this district. A new one just opened up in, in Weaverville. Uh, state of the art, beautiful, providing services to the entire uh, community there. 
I think it's once again, not to bang my tribal drum too much tonight, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, I think you have to look at your partners and I think you have to look at your partnerships. I think if you're moving forward uh, with blinders on about how you can bring services to your community, you're doing a disservice to your community. Uh, in, the in the town of Orleans, uh, which uh, isn't very big, uh, the clinic there is a tribally run clinic that serves the entire community uh, and does so understanding the relationship between the federal government uh, and the state government and local communities. Uh, but more importantly, we have to have someone in Sacramento that understands what it's like in the rural parts of this district to ensure laws like this don't get passed. And when they do, to ensure that there are cutouts for us to make sure that we can apply by them. Ariel? This is an issue that not only is a priority for me as someone who grew up in a rural community, as someone who's served on the board of the Healthcare Foundation, Northern Sonoma County, uh, actually starting in 2013, I was invited to join the Healthcare Foundation board and ask to be their fund de development chair, something I had never done before for a nonprofit. I was working for the America's Cup, the sailing race, and I had a sports marketing background. I knew how to build a sponsorship portfolio. I knew how to sell uh, corporate businesses on investing in a big idea like a sports race. When I joined the Healthcare Foundation board, they said, we are tasked with saving the Healdsburg District Hospital, a hospital in our community that is at, uh, in a state of disrepair, and if we don't raise the funds, the hospital will close. I took that as a mandate from my community and went out and helped them raise over $6 million to save the hospital. We did that through corporate support, private philanthropic dollars, state grants, county grants, et cetera. I know how critically important it is to keep these hospitals open. I'm also very concerned about kicking the can down the road because we know our communities are, are not going to withstand some of these future disasters. We keep seeing so many more um, year after year. So I don't wanna see us extend the 2030 deadline. I do wanna see us uh, get scrappy and entrepreneurial and have someone who's gonna go fight for those resources and bring them home to our communities. I do think that for some communities who are demonstrating that they've been able to start saving money and capital dollars um, to put towards their future retrofits, there may be instances where we allow those hospitals to extend the deadline. But I think wholesale, we're seeing large corporations who certainly have the resources available to start those retrofits now, but they're choosing to spend those dollars in a different way, and they're not investing in our rural communities. And I think there needs to be accountability at the state level, not just through policy, but also through oversight um, to hold those hospital corporations accountable to start investing those dollars now. Thank you. Um, this may be our last question before we um, have you do your wrap up. Um, and this question was inspired by Menkesethi our community manager. Now, at the Mendocino County Democratic Central Committee Forum this week, you were asked two separate questions. One was about how to deal with the looming state budget deficits, and another about the ongoing affordable housing crisis. I want to combine these two issues because the projected budget to address the deficit is to dramatically cut funds for affordable housing. I liken that to eating our seed corn, and it will exacerbate our current problems of not having adequate housing for service workers, tradespeople, teachers, medical staff, and families. Please describe how you would deal with both problems simultaneously and how you would enable our district to produce more housing across the income spectrum. You start, Mike. Yeah, that's, that's it's a good question. Quite frankly, I was just at a legislative meeting yesterday morning, $67 billion deficit, which has been reduced. Now that deficit was by the LAO. Well, the governor says it's $30 billion. Well, that was by his personal um, governmental agency, not the LAO that decided that. So we have a tremendous deficit. How can we combine the two with the money we have? With all the ideas we'd like to put into place, it costs money. We're inefficient. The state's inefficient. We can't combine the two. 
I have no idea right now how you can not have enough money to make sure that the people have the things they need and to increase that. We're spending a $20 billion to put a pipe under the Delta for water for Southern California, but we can't spend, you know, $100,000 on a clinic. We need to take a look at where our money is going. We don't know where it's happening. 80% of all nonprofit money is government money. So it's coming out of our pocket. Everything that we do on nonprofits comes out of our pocket. You know, so we have to take a look at that. So how is that going to help? What we do is we go ahead and create that. It just rolls over from one profit to another nonprofit with it. We don't know what programs are good, what programs aren't. You know, like Ariel said, Hillsburg can go ahead and cut that homeless thing down by that much. Maybe we should take that same way, the same things they're doing, and adapt it to the other places and quit funding all some of these other nonprofits that aren't showing the success. We need to go ahead and decide what we need to set priorities. What is going to work and where are we going to get the money? Right now, there are tax bills that will be out there to take the money out of our pockets to do some of these things, but yet we don't have any audits to show us what's happening and we don't know what's successful and we need to find out which ones are. Ed? The state deficit was predictable and uh, largely due to the um, nature of taxation in California and the good years, you know, stock options are being executed and the California collects a tax that's gonna do well. What needs to happen is that money needs to be set aside because we know we're going to have droughts and we know we need to spend it wisely. And it seems like when California gets that gold rush of cash, um, it spends a lot of money really quick on some questionable ideas. On housing, housing at $550 a square foot, you're not going to have affordable housing in this community or anywhere in the assembly district. Unless you're a very affluent neighborhood, it's not gonna happen. What's even harder in the rural area is you don't have the economy of scale and you don't have the infrastructure. So you're looking at that same building code, the same compliance cost as building in the city, only you don't have the water infrastructure, the sewer infrastructure, the economy of scale on labor. You talk to um, uh, housing uh, developers, larger scale, not the one or four houses, larger scale, and they tell you it'll cost more to pull off that same construction here than um, a community like Tracy, because you don't have the, all the resources in place to do the assembly line. What we need from the state is recognition that one size doesn't fit all. That code and compliance that makes sense for urban environments applied here is a halt to all new housing at all levels. You're gonna have some custom homes from people who have lifetime savings have done well, but you're not gonna have um, housing for the people who serve the community. And this is a great example. You have communities here that are, that are aging out and I'm glad you get to enjoy it. But when you look for services, you're gonna find, you don't have young people to come in to provide those services, whether it's in-home supportive care, nursing, dentistry, uh, teaching, civil, public works, it's not going to exist. We've regulated ourselves out of housing. Uh, thank you. As I mentioned, I've got a master's in public administration with a specialty in budgeting. Was actually the first mayor in over a decade to balance Santa Rosa's budget. And at the same time was able to navigate us to getting the second highest score in the state for the pro housing designation. What developers really look at when they're developing housing is time certainty and cost that oftentimes when they have plans that they can put in place, that they know that they're gonna be able to execute, they're happy to shoulder that risk, but it's when you have arbitrary delays for the housing getting built, it becomes more expensive. You see the cost of the materials and labor go up, it becomes unpredictable, and that's what really kills projects. What the legislature needs to continue to do is to incentivize local governments to do the planning up front on housing projects but then get out of the way and actually let them get built. Uh, one of the things we don't talk enough about is we talk about housing as economic development, and that's true, but affordable housing actually doesn't pay property taxes back to your local jurisdictions. 
So you have a mandate to build affordable housing, and that's oftentimes the workers that you need, but then that doesn't drive the local economy and have that feedback loop into getting more projects that are built. That's where the state needs to step in with mandates and with, with funds. Uh, you have almost $700,000 per affordable unit of housing in California right now. We can and should incentivize fee deferrals until occupancy, so that that way it removes some of the risk for the developer and allows them to actually get the project built, but that requires local governments being made whole by the state as well. We need to make it easier for folks to get site clearances once the general plan's been done and once environmental impact reports have been done on the area, and we need to figure out how to have local governments work together. We created the Renewal Enterprise District in Santa Rosa, which is a collaboration between the city and the county literally using each other's CEQA exemptions and access to financing so that we could do multiple projects at the same time and try to bring down that cost. Yes, more rural areas are further apart, but that doesn't mean you can't have those partnerships to make the financing work. Well, I dropped out of college, uh, but I have increased our budget for the tribe tenfold. Uh, we've built hundreds of units uh, in downtown Arcata, Eureka, Crescent City, uh, and out in the rural parts of the reservation as well, where we had to extend the road and the power line uh, to get there. And it is more expensive, absolutely. Uh, I think when you understand, as Ted said, what equity truly means, you get the job done. Uh, and you ensure that the profitability that you make in more urban areas is equally divided out to your rural areas so that your communities can be built. Because let's be honest, when we're talking about housing, we're talking about our community. It's the backbone of every single community. Uh, and without it, I mean, honestly, you know, it wouldn't exist. Uh, we've built transitional housing. We've built low income housing. We've built fair market housing. We've ensured that individuals who can build are allowed to build. Uh, I think this is an important issue for me uh, because it's what we've been successful doing, and we've been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, I absolutely understand uh, the complexity of bringing in private partnerships along with philanthropic funding, state and funding as well, because that's what it takes. Uh, as I've said before, it's an all of the above answer. Uh, you have to bring in individual private corporations. You have to bring in state funding. You have to reach out to our philanthropic partners. You have to understand the federal system, uh, and you have to work them together. Uh, absolutely, uh, we need to do more work in our communities uh, to build the type of communities we want to see in 10 or 15 years. And there's no sense in talking about how we're going to fund a hospital if there's no one there to work in it. This has been one of the most complicated issues that I've tackled in my time on City Council and the Planning Commission. Uh, as someone who has spent um, many conversations, many dinner table conversations talking about how do we get more residential housing built, my husband happens to be a general contractor who builds homes, this is an issue that we talk about every single day. We talk about the regulatory framework, but then also what is um, making it very difficult for folks who want to go out and build homes, how do we get it done? Um, I'm really proud of the work that the city of Healdsburg has done, uh, where we went from being a community where we were very one of very few cities in the state who actually met our housing mandate in the last cycle. We've become a pro-housing city by designation of the governor, and we've built more homes in the last three years than over the last 20 years. And we've done it by bringing our community together doing engagement with our Latino community, with seniors, with our working class, with our teachers and firefighters, and making sure that everyone could have a voice in the process of deciding where do we wanna build homes? Where is it safe? Where do we have the resources, the natural resources or otherwise? And then getting consensus, bringing people together, and then making a plan, investing in those planning dollars that we got from the state, which is, I think, a great opportunity for, for local communities to go out to uh, planning resource dollars and bring them home. And I think that's what we should all demand of our next assembly member. Um, put those plans in place, do the environmental review up front, and then get out of the way. 
we know that when we have urgency, like after the fires, local government can move quickly, but we need to have the, the energy and the incentive there, like what's happening now with the pro-housing designation. There's a pot of money for these cities who've gone out and gotten that designation, and those dollars expire. And you need to be scrappy, and you need to work hard to get those dollars and bring them home to our communities. That's something that I've done for the past several years and something that I want to continue to do for this whole region. Rusty. Your question linked the two, linked yeah. the state budget and uh, the housing crisis that we have. <clears throat> Certainly with regards to the state budget, absolutely the structure that we have uh, almost um, results in a boom and bust. We're up 100 billion and then we're down 68 billion and then we're up 20 billion. So it's very swingy and I think that's something that we have to address. It is a hard conversation to have, but it is one that California absolutely needs to have. In this year's budget, I think we're, we're, we're called upon to focus on those core functions of government. Certainly education, healthcare, public safety. And we've seen in the governor's budget that he's already put forward, you see cuts to housing related programs. You've seen cuts to climate related programs, which are um, real uh, crisis in and of itself because of the long-term impact of that. I think what it speaks to is that state government is not in the position to subsidize housing, broadly speaking, whether it's affordable market rate workforce, whatever it might be, there is not enough money to get ourselves out of the hole that we're in. And therefore the partnership with private industry, I think is particularly important. And uh, I think uh, Council Member Rogers said it, which is time is money. Essentially, if you have a project that is approved uh, for a particular piece of property that you have, if you can get a, sh a shovel in the ground within 60 days, you're going to be able to move that project pretty quick. Um, I, I think there's um, uh, things that the state can do to help support local governments that are moving as quickly as possible. And the last thing I would say is we should view this as a jobs opportunity. The reality is uh, the construction that's required to produce this type of housing uh, has the opportunity to drive communities. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for your detailed answers. And I had more questions. There were two different ones on the California Coastal Commission and one on ERAF. And we don't have time for that today. So I want to have you come up in the same order you did before. That way, the last word will be Frankie's. OK, since, yeah. and. It's usually you get the first that. Anyway, we're going to do that. And then just to make sure everyone knows there is a, um, a, a wine and cheese reception at the Del Mar house afterwards. And when we get done, after you get done, I'm going to wrap it up with a little, couple more words. So come on up, Rusty. Two minutes. And I get five, I think is what he... <laughs> That, that's equity. I think at this point, everybody's going to cede all their time to Frankie, and he's just going to get up here and talk for 12 minutes. Um, well, first, let me just wrap up by just simply saying thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have uh, to host this conversation and the opportunity that we'll uh, continue to have over the next, uh, next uh, three weeks uh, or so. Um, I think I shared my, my story and my record as a labor leader and organizer standing up for working people. Uh, the work that I've done in service to our country, uh, the work that I do in the classroom teaching incarcerated students. We don't get the opportunity uh, to have a full in-depth policy discussion um, on these important issues. We get questions and we get the opportunity to respond in 60, 90, or 120 seconds. Um, I think what my hope is, is that the voters will look at is who has the ability to best represent our community to get something done in Sacramento. It is different than a local government job. It is different than being a member of Congress. It requires a unique skill set to represent a community 
in uh, the state capital and to recognize the relationships that are required at the local level. I'm incredibly proud of the campaign that I've been able to have uh, and, and conversation uh, with voters all across this district. There are 300,000, 306,000 voters uh, in this district, uh, and we have an obligation to stand up the kind of campaign to put our best foot forward, to have a full conversation with as many of them as possible. Certainly forums like this are one way to do that, but I'm incredibly proud to have the endorsement of Assembly Member Jim Wood, Wes Chesborough, and Patty Berg, along with firefighters and teachers and nurses, veterans uh, and leaders all across our state and all across uh, the North Coast. So I look forward to the continued conversation and thank you for the opportunity. Hopes and dreams are super. That's where ideas come from. But I'm a realist. I look at what's going on. I'm looking at the prices we're paying. I'm looking at the billions and billions of dollars that have been thrown out of this state government, the Democrats. And what do we have? Billions of dollars to education, homeless, health care. We have kids that can't read and do math. But I haven't had one question in any of these forums about education. Because education is essential. And it needs to be changed. We need to take a look at the way we do some of the education. I haven't heard anything about small businesses. I've been up and down the coast. I haven't heard one thing about the fish closure and how it's devastating Fort Bragg, how it's devastating Crescent City, the effect that it's having on Eureka, the effect it's having in Shelter Cove. These are the things. It's not the abortion issue. It's settled in California. What's important is what takes place here now, what we can do with our small businesses, how we can help our rural communities. Santa Rosa is not a rural community. LA, where Rusty's from, is not a rural community. We need to look what needs to be done here. And we need to look at it closely. We need to evaluate why aren't we getting those billions of dollars that are throwing out? Why aren't they coming here? With your support, I'll go there. I will be loud. They won't be able just to tell me to leave. I will be loud. I will stand up for rural communities and the things that we need. I know what we need. We need some education changes. We need some regulations taken care of because our small businesses can't operate. We can't work with, you know, CEQA because of the regulations. You can't build anything. We all know what these things are. These are the things that need to change. And this is something that has not been changed by the Democrats for the last 10 years when they've had the opportunity to do it and they have ignored it. Ask for your support. Thank you. One night I had this thought that we're doing worse than average. If we were to use the jury selection model to fill the legislature, I think we would have better results than what we have today. How do you explain that? It's money mixed with politics, and it's not working. One of the most important things you can do in this election cycle is look at where the money is coming from. If it's coming in district, that's your free speech. You have a candidate you want to support, by all means. But if that money is flowing from somewhere else, far away, you have to ask, what are those people buying? And what will this representative how will they vote? Will it be in favor of us or will it be in favor of those donors? And you look across the state, this is the biggest problem in California politics. We've talked about it for a long time. We need campaign finance reform. I hope that comes out of this cycle. Let's limit campaign contributions to registered voters within the district. Those are the people that deserve the representation. Um, I'll also come back and talk about this process. It's been surprisingly superficial. And it's almost like a pageant of banners and mailers. I go to the post office and there's all this crap that's gonna end up in a landfill. What is this? There's no substance. And except events like this, this one was well done, excellent questions. You, you're, This is democracy, right? You're su success here today. I appreciate the organizers. I appreciate the other candidates. I have a lot good to say about them but we've, we've, we've got to throw out the establishment in Sacramento. 
you know, we're so brainwashed into thinking when somebody shows up, um, you know, with a pet project and a, that creates a headline that we're, that our government's working for us. You, this is the richest state, the most successful state. And look at the problems that you have to deal with. Lack of access to health care, your ambulance can't get enough funding, no funding for fire. I mean, the list goes on. In California, this is wrong. And it wasn't always this way. We need to set a new course. I appreciate your support. No, just thank you so much. I want to echo all of the gratitude for having this type of forum. Uh, in races like this one, it is a ton of glossy mailers that come, and it's hard to really cut through what's real and what's not, to be honest. I'm very proud of my track record. As I mentioned, I was born here. I have fought for these communities, and this is where my wife and I are starting our family. Uh, endorsements in a race like this uh, are really just value add. It tells you for folks uh, who might not have worked with some of us, what our values are, what our accomplishments are. Uh, this is speed dating. Uh, when we do this at the dais, you are describing complex things like budgets and housing in two minutes. But what you can't, uh, what you can't hide, what you can't make up, are those relationships, that track record, and when folks say this is our person, that you know that that means something. Uh, I mentioned at the outset, I was very proud to receive the endorsement from Senator Mike McGuire. That's not because I can raise the most money for him. That's not because I have the most connections up and down California. It's because out of all of these candidates, he felt like I've worked the hardest and delivered for this district. And when he cares about this district, he wants to make sure that it's left to somebody who he knows loves it just as much as he does. Mike McGuire, Senator, uh, Congressman Mike Thompson, Congresswoman Lynn Wolsey, those folks support me because I care, because I wanna go up to Sacramento and I wanna get things done. I've worked on legislation in 14 states. I've worked with our government bureaucracies. I also have worked as the executive director for a nonprofit that does environmental policy. That's why I have the trust of groups like the Sierra Club. I'd be honored to have your support as well. My website is chrisrogersforassembly.com. My cell phone number is on it, my personal cell phone. Would love to have a conversation if you have other questions. I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be here to talk to all of you. Thank you for taking the time out of your weekend to come hear us speak. I think it speaks volumes to the passion and civic engagement in this community. And I look forward to continuing to work in partnership with you to solve some of the small and large challenges that are impacting your community. As someone who grew up in a rural community, who works in a small town, who's raising two kids and been successful in the private sector, nonprofit sector, and in local government, I'm proud of my record in delivering for my community and for our region. Um, but also, I see the challenges in front of us. I, I think to the question of what is what have we gotten from Sacramento? What does it mean to have all these mandates? Well, we have a beautiful coastline. We have clean air to breathe. And we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we can preserve some of these amazing assets for the next generation. And I think about it every single day when I'm tucking them into bed at night. How do we ensure that we can protect this place and also ensure we're building the housing, the jobs, the next generation of innovators to make sure that they're taking our state to new heights. I've been endorsed by the Legislative Women's Caucus of all the female Democrats in Sacramento, people who have said, we have an empty seat at our table and we're waiting for you to come join us. I've been endorsed by Reproductive Freedom for All, the only candidate endorsed by Reproductive Freedom for All, people like the Sonoma County Sheriff and our local firefighters have endorsed me. My entire city council, people who we don't agree politically, but they know that I listen, that I know how to build consensus and I know how to get the job done. And in that work, it's something that I'm very proud of and something that I don't take lightly. This is a responsibility to show up, speak up and deliver for our community. And as your next assembly member, I would be so honored to be able to do that work to support this region. So my name is Arielle Kelly, and I'd be happy to 
uh, talk more at the reception afterwards if you have questions. And thank you so much to our organizers for putting this on. There's endorsements that you earn uh, based on the work that you've done because they believe in your leadership, they believe in what you can accomplish. There's endorsements you can buy because of how much money you've brought in. And there's endorsements that you get because they wanna parlay favor because they think you might win and they wanna make sure that you're good friends when you become elected. The problem is it's very hard to tell the difference. It's very difficult to hear the ones that are actually meaningful, the ones that are actually trash. Uh, what I ask you, and this isn't enough time to get to know any of us, what I ask you is use the tools we have. Look at each of us up. We, we all are online. The work we've done is there. Figure out whether someone actually stands for the environment. Figure out whether actually someone stands for this district. Do a bit of work. That's what's gonna need to happen in this race, is we need the voters to do some work. Uh, go beyond the very colorful uh, mailers that we're all sending out and skip over this uh, speed dating that we're doing now. And dig in, uh, learn about us as people. It's an amazing tool we have. And I'll say this, there are phenomenal options on candidates here, people that would do a fantastic job of representing the district. But in my opinion, there's only one choice. Are we gonna vote for progress, for a different type of leader, or are you gonna vote for what we've always done? VoteFrankieMyers.com. Thank you all for hosting this event. I appreciate all of my friends up here on the panel and everything they've had to say. Welcome. Hey, it's 4.57. I think we're actually going to be ending on time. Yay. Okay. No, I think it's the whole time. <laughs> so um, my wrap up is to give you a um, invitation to come back to future forums. The next one that is scheduled is Saturday, March 9th. And that will be in celebration of the 50th production of the Sea Ranch Thespians. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I don't have it scheduled yet, but I'm working with um, Aline Canby to do a forum in May for a bio blitz for Sea Ranch. So one of the traditions we do at the Sea Ranch Forum is that we help out the facilities and resources crew by putting our chairs away and we'll be getting those out. So before you go to the Del Mar house, which is right over there for cheese and nibbles and sips and stuff, please put your chair away. And um, thank you so much for everything.